I ended up last time talking about what it's like to be friends with a man named Joseph Stalin. The friendship was forced by circumstance, and a lot of times in life, your friendships are, or relationships are forced by circumstance. You might find yourself in a job situation with a coworker you cannot stand. And my oldest daughter is experiencing some of that right now. We tell her you're going to find this everywhere you go. The co-worker who knows more than she does and that doesn't hesitate to tell her so and that knows about how to do everything. And my daughter knows how to do nothing. Okay. You run into that everywhere you go. Um, and it's a part of life. And this is basically what Roosevelt ran into with Stalin. And in fact, Stalin was such a good friend that when the war was over, Stalin proceeded to take over one third of Eastern Europe. Oh, well, how many countries? Uh, Romania, Czechoslovakia, Poland, East Germany, East Berlin, um, Albania, Yugoslavia, took over a big chunk of Europe. I know the three conferences I want to talk about where well, the three men sat down were, first of all, Tehran. That's in northern Iran. Tehran, uh, Yalta, and Potsdam. The most famous of these conferences by far is the Yalta Conference. Your book shows two pictures of the Yalta Conference. So one of them is on page 755. And then the same picture is shown about three or four pages later, yeah, on page 762. Um, you might not can tell, in the picture, Stalin has this old, confident look about him. He realizes he's in charge because he plans to cheat. What's that? Is this chapter? I'm still in chapter 25. I'm just about to end chapter 25. Yeah. All right. Anyway. <clears throat> I, I always, I want to say this, I always say that if I ever get to be a teacher, I don't want to overlook these conferences. Because later on, a lot of the leftist history books tended to overlook them. But I want to say this about these authors, they put them in and give them credit. Essentially, now, I want to say, in one word, what happened at these three conferences was, Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe was, betrayed to the communist. Now, as a young man, I read a book that taught me to really criticize Roosevelt. About Roosevelt was at these first two conferences. The two conferences were attended by Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin, as your book shows a picture of them. And Stalin here looks really confident. Again, he knows what he's doing. He's going to cheat him in every which way. Roosevelt at this time was an extremely sick man, which I think the picture pretty well brings forth, and your book mentions he only lived two months after this, and Churchill was head of a country that was really by this time weak and beat up and deep, hopeless, almost hopelessly deep in debt and battered, and he himself was battered because his people unelected him shortly after this. So. Uh, Stalin was the only one who attended the three conferences. Now, the last conference was attended by President Harry Truman, who took over after Roosevelt. And I'll quote Truman. I read a book that he wrote many years ago. He said, those Soviets, they never fooled me after Potsdam, which was a frank admission that they had fooled him good at the Potsdam conference. Again, Truman was just a new president starting out. and He had not really had much to do with Roosevelt. Um, and did not know a lot about foreign policy. Anyway, um, now, like I say, as a young man, I was I convinced myself that Roosevelt had no business meeting with Stalin, but then someone else pointed out, hey, Stalin deserved to be there. He had been in the war longer than anyone else except for Churchill, but he'd been in the war longer than Roosevelt. There was no real way to keep him out. He was entitled to it. There was nothing that Roosevelt could have done but said, hey, Mr. Stalin, you come in here too because you deserve to be here. You've contributed a big chunk of the war effort. There was no way to keep him out. 
essentially the ground without Roosevelt, I believe without Roosevelt meaning to, the groundwork was laid to where Eastern Europe was sold to the communists, and Eastern Europe then was to become part of the Iron Curtain countries for the next 45 years. All right, I'm going to close out chapter 25 here. We spent a good bit of time on it. And open up to chapter 26. Before I proceed, does anyone have any questions or comments? All right, chapter 26. Again, your book opens up a new unit here about toward a global civilization. Um, well, by the way, uh, the Yalta conference occurred in the Crimea, which is making a lot of big news, even as I speak. The uh, alliance between Great Britain the Soviet Union and the United States was called the Grand Alliance, and it actually would collapsed even before the war with Japan ended. Uh, it lasted throughout the war with Europe. The war in Europe ended in May. The war in Japan ended in uh, August. The Grand Alliance quickly collapsed, and the Soviet <coughs> Union moved in quickly to dominate Eastern Europe. Your book shows a map over on page 763. Now that they took over Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, East Germany, Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was borderline. Um, Stalin said, well, we need this territory to serve as a buffer between us and Germany. Because after all, in the last 25 years, we fought two wars with Germany. And who knows but what Germany might invade us again. So we want all these territories to be a buffer. So he used that as justification for taking over. Oh yes, as for Poland, Stalin said he wanted a bunch of Polish territory. So to make up for the territory that the, that the Soviet Union took from Poland, they, they took territory on Poland's eastern side, but on Poland's western side, they gave Poland some of Germany's territory so that when the war was over, Germany was to have less territory than they had before. Hitler said Germany needs more land. When it was over, they had less land. And the history books when I was a kid would say that the German people living in what is now Poland, either they have left Poland to go back to Germany or to go live in Germany, or they will leave, but now they all have left. And when Germany became a United Nation in 1990, they promised the world that we will not try to take back the land that was given to Poland that they're going to be content with the land they have, and so far they have not. All right, Soviet Union took over Eastern Europe and was to hold it under communism for the next 45 years. Winston Churchill made a speech in which he said, an iron curtain has descended over Europe And from that point on, the term Iron Curtain was to be used to describe countries under communism. An Iron Curtain is descended over Europe. Now, about this time, Winston Churchill was asked to speak at a college graduation, and he made another speech that this, the students who heard it will never forget. I mean, he was expected he'd speak for about 30 minutes, so he got up for 30 minutes, and he said, never give up. Never, never, ever give up. Don't ever, don't ever give up. Never give up for 30 minutes. That's all he said. Don't ever give up. And those students, I'm sure, remember that speech the rest of their lives. Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill. Yeah, I don't write that down. But the part about the Iron Curtain, yeah, that I want you to remember. Uh, Iron Curtain had descended over Germany. Um, the war that followed was called the Cold War. <coughs> now, I want to say this tongue in cheek because, folk, it looked like the Cold War had ended in 1990. But fast forward to 2014, and it looks like the Cold War has just started all over again after, after about 24 years. We're fighting it again. Uh, but we thought the Cold War had ended in 1990. We thought that the United States had won it. 
But anyway, the Cold War started. It was called a Cold War because it did not, for the most part, did not erupt into a shooting war. Now, there were times when shots were fired, particularly in uh, Korea and Vietnam, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But uh, otherwise, the United States rarely came into direct hard confrontation with the Soviet Union. The Truman Doctrine, all right. Where the Truman promised aid to countries that were felt threatened by communism. Now, most specifically, I mean, since the, the communists had already taken over a third of Europe, Greece and Turkey were right at the border, so uh, the, main, the main nations involved in Truman Doc were Greece, and your book only mentions, by the way, Greece, but also some of the books will tell you that Turkey was also included, but Truman said any nation that feels like it's threatened by a communist takeover, we will come to your aid. This did not apply to nations who were already behind the Iron Curtain. We're going to see how that one nation after another during those 45 <coughs> years would try to rebel and the rest of the world would do absolutely nothing to help them. Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia in particular. Uh, but by 1990, all these nations told the Soviets, go home. And the Soviet Union went home. So that was come 1990. Anyway. Now, I want to say this about Turkey. There was really little chance that Turkey would go communistic. The reason for that being, all right, they both, the, all right, Turkey was primarily a Muslim country. The Muslims and communists have one thing in common. They believe in absolute control. But they have one big difference. Anybody know what the difference is? One difference will keep them apart. It should be obvious. Anybody can guess? What's that? What's that? Religion, an extremely good attempt. The communists say that there is no God. The Muslim people are convinced there is one. And that right there has kept most Muslim countries from going over to communism. If the communists would admit or would uh, allow for the existence of God, but they don't. But they might, um, I will say this about the Muslim world. In World War I, they sided with Germany, and they lost. In World War II, they sided with Germany, and they lost. During the Cold War, they tended to side with the Soviet Union, and watched the Soviet Union lost. And then he finally decided we have to do our own fighting. But, I mean, uh, this movement, Islam, would have, and I think every Islamic person knows it, Islam would have conquered the world if they wouldn't have started fighting amongst themselves. And the same, that, that's, uh, keep that thought in mind because I'm going to repeat it later on when I'm talking about communism. Communism might have conquered the world also, except they started fighting among themselves, which happens in all these big movements. All right. In addition to the Truman Doctrine, a big part of public policy at this time involved the Marshall Plan. plan was where we decided to give aid to European nations torn by war. We wound up giving aid to Japan also. It was to rebuild European countries after except 
there was one huge exception, a country we did not give aid to, and that was the Soviet Union. Now, why did we leave the Soviet Union out? We told the Soviet Union, particularly Stalin, we said, Stalin, you have taken over Eastern Europe, you've gone against what we thought was a treaty at the Yalta. Uh, actually, the Soviets interpreted that treaty differently. I mean, that's the excuse your book uses. Personally, I think that dealing with Stalin was like dealing with Hitler. You cannot count on them to keep your treaties. But anyway, we said, you broke your treaty in Yalta, so we're not going to give aid to you, but we're going to help rebuild even Germany. We're going to help rebuild Italy. Of course, we're going to help rebuild Great Britain and Poland. And no, not Poland. Not Poland. Poland was an iron curtain country. Basically, it was to help rebuild countries like Greece that, uh, and Great Britain, and especially Germany, that had been hit hard by the war. And Stalin was very upset. He said, you're helping our enemies, and you're helping your enemies, and not helping us. Um, so Europe then divided into two camps. <coughs> All right. Essentially, the one camp set up a treaty organization called NATO or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. NATO consisted of the United States and Canada on the western side of the Atlantic, and Iceland in the middle of the Atlantic, and Great Britain and France and Spain and a whole bunch of countries, Germany also, on the other side of the Atlantic, and even had Turkey involved. Turkey has been a member of NATO for a good many years. Didn't France leave NATO? At one point, yes. Yep, De Gaulle pulled them out. NATO is still around, though, and uh, in fact, when trouble broke out in Bosnia and the United Nations wouldn't touch it, there was NATO that moved in and tried to settle the conflict. But NATO is still around. The communist world met at a place called Warsaw and formed the Warsaw Pact Nation. Warsaw is in Poland. The Warsaw Pact countries consisted of all the Iron Curtain countries, the ones I named the Soviet Union and its satellite countries. So Europe divided itself into two camps, NATO on the one hand, the Warsaw Pact on the other. The first direct confrontation of the Cold War involved what we call the Berlin Blockade. All right, here's the situation that Berlin found itself in. When the war was over, and I'm just going to draw a really simplified map, let's say this is Germany. The countries that helped defeat Germany decided to occupy it. So Great Britain got a part of Germany, France got another part, the United States got another part, and the Soviet Union. They were entitled to their share, so they divided Germany into four sections with now, these three places, Great Britain's part, France, the United States, joined together, united, to form West Germany. The Soviet Union would go along with it, so the Soviet Union formed a country called East Germany. And Germany then was to be divided for the next 45 or so years, until about 1990, the two Germanys finally united. Now, now, here was the city of Berlin. Berlin was um, inside the Soviet territory because, as I mentioned, when the war was ending, the Soviets got to Berlin first, and then they took a bunch of territory around Berlin. So because they were occupying this, they said, uh, no, we have this territory. But they agreed to divide Berlin up, with the Soviet Union getting about half of it. And then Great Britain and France and the United States getting an equal shares of the other half. The book shows a map of how it was divided on page 766, and you can see the Soviet Union has almost half of Berlin. 